Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listener, to episode 73 of the Ad Nauseam podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm here on a rare uh, daylight session in the vomitory, although it's always usually the same amount of light here in the vomitory, no matter yes. what time of day we're doing this. The curtains are blackened. The curtains are blackened, but I'm the- feeling a little bit more... Um, bushy-tailed, it being earlier in the day. <laughs> somewhat bright-eyed. Somewhat, somewhat bright-eyed. Not, not all the way there, but um, the standard fatigue is at a lower level for it's me. It's true. It's true. And so I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm ready. I'm ready. And listener, as, as always, I'm here with my good friend, Dr. David Noe. Uh, Dave, tell us a little bit how you're feeling this afternoon. I'm feeling ready to go. Yes. I, uh, I'd like to wrap up this three-parter on Cicero. Well, you, you, you sound like you've had enough. No, no, no. It's just I spent a lot of time with this guy back in the late '90s, early 2000s, mm-hmm. and I still love his style. But there are a lot of other really important things that we would like to talk about. This is very true, right? And let's be honest, yep. right? Uh, people don't always listen to us so much to be instructed. Mm-hmm. They're here for the... I- no. no? <laughs> <laughs> They're here for the entertainment value. A, oh. close, a close family member told me just this week, yeah. quote, I don't listen to every episode. What? Yes. Can you believe that? Really? It was... Uh, it, it cut me to the quick, let's yeah, say. Yeah, I can see that you're still um, kind of reeling from I it. am reeling. That's yeah. right. Right. So you, th- you think people are coming here just, just for the laughs? Mostly for the laughs. Okay. I'm reeling like old film footage. <laughs> gotcha. Right. Well, but there's still plenty to riff on when it comes to oh, yeah. old Marcus Tullius, right? Yeah, we got a whole book of chickpea still. Yeah. Oh, w- yeah. Without a doubt. What's so up with the gods? So we're, we're going to cover book three of yep. Cicero's uh, De Naturo Deorum mm-hmm. today and, and close out this three-parter. And um, well, well, we'll give the, the listener a little bit of a, of a taste um, in a second, but let's get to our shout out. We got is, a shout out. So yep. Who does this go to? This comes from the right Reverend Dr. Henry Jansma, okay. a friend of mine who lives uh, out in New Jersey, a longtime friend. And uh, he sent me this bio and he said, use as little as you wish. Oh, okay. Which was kind of him because let me tell you, it's long. He's got a long bio. This here, guy yeah. has an impressive resume. <laughs> Born in northern New Jersey in the, should we say, just late 1950s. Mm-hmm. His parents were immigrants from Friesland. You guys oh. are probably related. It's possibly. The, the John Ma, the right? Old, the old Dutch bingo. Yeah, right? you know yeah. the names that end in Ma and Ga? Uh-huh. Those are all Frisian. Yes, right? right. Yeah. He began his study of Latin as an undergraduate in 1977 and done a bit of reading for pleasure or for research in Latin through the years. Went to England in 1985 to be mother, apparently. And what? Did you get that from the tea ad last time? We, oh, yeah. Okay, now I got it. How so, short your sorry, memory. I, mean, I thought I was, maybe I'm not as bright eyed as I thought I was today, but yeah, please keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and then he went to Westminster, Philadelphia. Well, after Westminster, Philadelphia, and uh, got a PhD at Durham. Man, this guy's been all over the place. He has. He wrote a very interesting thesis on the prophetic office in uh, John Calvin's theology. A student of the Reformation and early Anglican theology loves to study Latin. Uh, he was ordained in the Church of England in 91, has gone through so many different important. Um, Positions. Let's see what else. Oh, here's an interesting detail. His wife's name is Barbara. <laughs> that is very interesting. He's got, I see that he also he has two grown children. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a daughter-in-law and a future daughter-in-law in the wings. Fantastic. Is that where you keep a daughter-in-law? That, that's generally speaking. Oh, in the yeah. wings. Okay. In the wings, yeah. And they live in uh, Mount Ephraim, New Jersey. Yes. Okay. Keen Gardner. Now, uh, Henry has participated in some of my online classes. Reading a little bit of Latin together, sharp guy, sharp guy, real sharp. And uh, I I think I especially enjoy the photos of his rose garden that he posts on the social medias. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. I see he also likes to watch Laurel and Hardy. I didn't notice that. Yeah, see that? um, When it comes to that, uh, are you a Laurel and Hardy or are you a Three Stooges guy? uh, None of the above. None? No, I'm an Abbott and Costello. Oh, okay. An Abbott and Costello and primarily a Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers, gotcha. Yeah, I like to refer to myself as a Marxist. (laughs) A a Groucho Marxist. A Groucho Marxist. I got you. I'm I'm with you there. You know what he says. Whatever it is, his political philosophy. It is, I'm against it. Whatever it is, I'm against it. And he would never want to join a club that would would have him as a member. Exactly. Right, right, right. right. So uh, a proud Marxist. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Henry Jansen. Do you think Henry listens to every episode? He better. That's all I can say. <laughs> he better. All right, Dave, tell us, okay, what are we going to get into today? So today we are leaving behind books one and two. The listener, the viewer will remember, book one is the elucidation of the Epicurean view of the gods. Mm-hmm. The gods don't care about us. Yep. They're there, but they're off doing godlike things. 
After book one, there is the Stoic Refutation, which is in book two. And so in book two, the Stoic uh, Balbus refutes Velaeus, the Epicurean from book one, and sets out the Stoic view of the gods. Yes. And remember, the Stoic view of the gods has four different parts, right? Remind They us. exist, uh, was the first one. Then what are they like? Quales sint? What are their characteristics? The third one was that they care for the... Hu- no, I'm sorry, that the world is governed and created by them, created right. and governed. Yep. And the fourth one is that they care for the human race. So it's a, a, a radical a radical change from what Villaeus was, was, was putting forth. It's right, a clear right. departure from Epicureanism. Yep. The gods exist and they care for us. They take care of us. Now, as we pivot, everybody likes to say that, to book three, mm-hmm. we have the refutation of the Stoic position as presented by the gentleman that represents uh, Cicero, namely Kata. Kata. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, all right. Before we dive in, though, yes. I, I think, uh, did we promise the, the listener last time a little bit more about Mr. Rackham? Yes. We were going to solve a little bit of the Rackham mystery. Apparently, our uh, diversion into the history of board games, and it's not really a board game. It's a boring game. It's a boring game, yes. You're referring to Racco. I'm referring to Racco. Do you think that will become a running gag? <laughs> Personally, I hope so. The yes. listener might disagree. Well, you know, but. when the name of your podcast is Ad Nauseam and you work in the vomitorium, yeah. everything's a running gag. <laughs> That's very, very true. That's very true. Yeah, I got to say, you know, I came... I came home that night, right? And I, the first thing I said to my wife was like, "Did you guys ever, did you ever grow up playing Racco?" And she said, "You know, what are you talking about?" Yes, exactly. And so I was in it. I went on and on about Racco, and she actually asked me to stop. <laughs> yes, you stopped. She said, <laughs> "She said, join the boat." Join the boat. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So, do you got some information? I on have it? some information okay. on Rackham. It was actually one um, Henry Jansma that sent me Rackham's obituary. Oh, wow. And as a classicist myself, who will someday die, all things being equal, mm-hmm. I think it's interesting to read a classicist's obit. Yeah. Did so you know you... that obituary is of Latin origin? I did know okay, that. Okay, all right. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, so what did you find out? I found out. Did you find uh, out what the H stands for? It stands for Harris. Harris Rackham. Mr. Harris Rackham, yep. fellow of Christ Church, Cambridge, died early yesterday. Now, this was uh, in 1944. It was an hour yesterday. Okay. By his death, Cambridge loses a fine classical scholar, and Christ's College loses a loyal and influential member. Hmm. She was born in 1868 and was educated at City London College, went to Cambridge. Uh, he was uh, first in the classical trip boss after two first classes in the classical trip boss he was elected a fellow in 1894 now that's a british thing right the, the trip boss the, the, like I getting first and oh yeah yeah yeah, very competitive, yeah. academically competitive, yeah. which I think explains a lot of the excellent philology that came out of England Without a doubt. in the 19th century. Yeah. But he went on to translate Cicero's De Finibus, The End of Good and Evil, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. He uh, was interested in poetry, a pictorial and plastic art, toured the United States and Canada. Canada. He sympathized strongly with the Labor Party. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, then eventually in his retirement, translated Natura de Orum, the Academica, and some of Pliny's natural history. So he was in his uh, scholarly work was mostly in translation? Is, yes, I mean, it looks that? like okay. translation right. and teaching. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, not to what one would call original scholarship. Right. We both know that in the world of academia, original scholarship is highly valued. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I like original scholarship Probably not as much as the next guy. <laughs> but the translators, like Rackham, here we are using uh, his work uh, almost 80 years after his death. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No. Because it has a, a lasting value. Sure. Even now, as it becomes archaic. And I think that, you know, if you're to compare original scholarship, although the, the myriad forms in which it can take, yep. if you were going to, in terms of uh, reach, if you were going to choose between original scholarship and maybe a translator, uh, getting your stuff before people's eyes, I would say go with translating. Yeah, I would say so too. Yeah. Everybody knows Stanley Lombardo, mm-hmm. right? And the work he's done. Good right. stuff. Now, I don't mean to... Um, no, no. I don't want, I mean to throw shade at Mr. Uh-oh. Rackham. I mean, having just read his obituary. Right, right. But um, and as as wonderful as his translation is, it's from 1933. I think we need a new edition. It needs to be redone. It That's true. Need, yes. Language changes. Right. Uh, archaisms, I think, ought to be updated. So, yeah, I think this is this one, um, which, you know, I admit uh, going into this, uh, this series that we've done, I didn't know a ton about this. I, I had not read De Natura De Orum. It was not part of my graduate work at all. Um, well, you, you pursued, right? Your interest in the classics was more literary than mine. It's, yeah, I right. got I got into it because of philosophy. Classics was a, you know, a subroom or a foundation is better of philosophy and theology. I, I've grown to appreciate Ovid, Virgil, and such things. Yes. But you kind of took a different route. That's true. That's true. Um, and the thing that I most appreciate about it is is maybe not so much 
um, the philosophical arguments here, but what it reveals about, you know, culturally speaking, about the ancient Romans. Yes. And we're going to talk a little bit about... We're going to get quite a bit of about, that. At, at the end here on, on some of those kind of, uh, those cultural differences between the Greeks and the Romans. Definitely. Right. And that's really the thesis of today's... Can, can an episode have a thesis? Of course it can have a thesis. A thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis? Maybe one of those three. All right. Go all Hegelian on you. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So where do we start? I think we should start at the beginning of book three, Liber Tertius. Sounds and good. Uh, I'd like to read the first sentence, which is also only, uh, I'm sorry, the first paragraph, which is just a few sentences. Okay. And then you'll give us the Rackham yes, I will. translation and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. So here goes. Quae cum balbus dixisset, tum adridens cotta, sero inquit, mihi balbe praecipis quid defendam, ego enem te disputante quid contradicerem mecum ipsa meditabar, nequitam refelendi tui causa, quam ea quae minus intelegebam requirendi, cum autem suo cuique judicio sit utendum, difficula factu est, me id sentire quod tu velis. All right. And in Rackham's translation, Cotta smiled when Balbus said this. It is too late, Balbus, he rejoined, for you to tell me what view I am to support. For, wh- for while you were discoursing, I was pondering what arguments I could bring against you, though not so much for the purpose of refuting you as of asking for an explanation of the points which I could not quite understand. However, each man must use his own judgment, and it is a difficult task for me to take the view which you would like me to take. Mm. Now, it seems it's, it's quite good. It's good, but and... At, uh, I mean, we'll talk about maybe kind of the persona of Kata here. Right. He sounds a little dangerous to me. He sounds like he'd be a, he kind of, you know, he's got the, it's the honey in the cup. He goes, I'm not, I don't really want to refute you, Bob, but I just, I just have some follow-up questions Yeah, here. yeah. But there's a... a Leading, a, right? There's a serpent under this flower, I think. Okay. All right. I haven't heard that expression. That's a, that's a Shakespearean serpent thing. Serpent behind the flower. Right, yeah. Interesting. I've heard teeth behind the smile. I think it's a... It's Do a, you know that one? Um... Teeth behind the smile, yeah, that's that. mm-hmm. right. I think it comes from Taming of the Shrew, where it okay. says she appeareth the innocent flower, but she's the serpent under it. I have an alternative, maybe. Okay, something that happens to me often. Yeah, it's the clog in my ice maker. <laughs> Does that happen to you? I don't have an ice maker. Your refrigerator doesn't it have does, an ice. No, we got, we, got, I, we got the basic model. Yeah, I don't want. To, we we got a nice one. Let yeah. me say we we spent on our refrigerator. Yeah, people warned me don't get this particular Korean brand. Because the ice maker will clog, and clog it does. Really? Yeah. So from the outside, yeah. like Kata, it has the appearance of great functionality, but there's a serpent under the flower. There's a clog in the there's ice. There's a maker. clog in the ice machine. So we'll see if that's we'll see if that holds up. Okay. Right. All right. It's kind of like when the what the prosecuting attorney steps up, and he approaches the witness to cross-examine, and he smiles at first and turns on his heel a little bit, and yes. then there's the pointed question. Right. That is going to happen. Okay. And God I is going to wheel around. He's going to wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And then he'll deal. And like you said, um, he's interesting. He represents Cicero, right? And if Cicero is anything, he's the consummate lawyer. Yes. And he's having fun, I think, in this representation. But let's look at a couple elements here uh, in what we quoted as just setting the stage for the rest of it. Okay. Uh, you said, uh, what was it? Not, not so much in order to um, refute you? Yes. It? Okay. Yep. Right, As so, of asking for an explanation of the points, which I could not quite understand. That's right. right. So the Latin is uh, refelendi tui causa. So not so much to refute you, he says. But then he goes on to say, but each man must use his own judgment, right? Mm-hmm. Sound familiar? Each, which, which of the three schools is that going to characterize? Well, that's going to be your, your academic. That's correct. Right, the skeptic. Yes. Epicureans, they follow their guy, the one that Lucretius in his poem uh, entitled The Whole Shebang, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Uh, refers to as a deus, right? He's yes. practically a god. And the Stoics, they're going to follow their Stoic luminaries. The academics, each is going to use his own judgment. Okay. All right. So, so that's intended to set the tone uh, for the whole book. Right. This, it, again, still sounds to me that Kata is, uh, he's, 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 the, he's the friendly uh, uh, attorney here. Yes. Like, yeah, oh, everyone has to decide for themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, okay. Well, let's... It is friendly, but it's a it's a real clear statement of academic. True. Um, gotcha. A- yes. Academic doctrine, you might say. Right. All right. So we saw Stoic theology in book two. Four ideas or terms are identified together, and they are ratio, reason, mm-hmm. natura, nature, mundus, the world, and deus, God. God. These four things are identical in Stoic theology. Reason is divine, nature is divine, the world is divine, and the gods are divine. So you can use any of these interchangeably. And the reason that this is important, so to speak, is that later on, as we're going to see, Kata says, I can't accept all of that 
but I'm going to adopt a modified stoic position that the gods actually do exist. Okay, so where, so where, uh, uh, am I jumping ahead too much? So where exactly does he disagree with Bulbas then? I mean, what is he modifying? I, <clears throat> well, he's going to criticize quite stridently many of the practices of Roman religion during the book. Okay. Uh, during the course of the book. And he's going to say, reason doesn't really lead us to these conclusions. You can't really use uh, Stoic syllogisms to establish the existence of God, of the gods. And he has a, um, an argument against their existence based on the wickedness, the evil in the world. It's mm. an argument from evil. Sure. But then at the very end, he does something that's quite strange and says, as we'll see, all in all, Sto uh, the Stoic position, Balbus is more correct than the Epicureans. Okay. This is a head scratcher. This is that rift in Cicero I was trying to put my finger on. Yeah. Uh, that how can he do that? How can a, an academic do that? If Cotta represents Cicero, how can Cicero do that? Hmm. The solution is going to be, it's because uh, the Stoic position is the closest to uh, Roman conservatism and ancient tradition. I see. Unlike the Greeks. Gotcha. So it's more than him just, I mean, if he's saying that, uh, you know, the Stoic position is slightly more persuasive than Valius, I mean, that doesn't really say a whole lot. It's like no. saying he's, it's the, he's the tallest building in Wichita. Oh, right? nice. So, um, but you're saying there's more to it than that. It's, there's more to it. It's not just that it's slightly more convincing. It's right. connected to something larger yes. in Roman uh, culture. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. The whole edifice collapses. Now, the whole Oedipus of Oedipus? <laughs> it's even Oedipus complex? <laughs> yes. The whole Oedipus of Roman religion, tradition, and the state, mm -hmm. all of all three of which are inseparable, okay. collapses if the gods don't exist. So they have to. I see. You see? Gotcha. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So Kata is going to take issue, right, with each one of these contentions uh, in book three. He's going to argue against reason being identified with nature, being identified with the world, being identified with the gods. Okay. And then book three ends with this statement by Cicero that has bedeviled interpreters actually since the patristic era. Should we save it? We should save Let's it. Let's save yeah, it. Okay, to the yeah. very end of the episode, right, three, right. four hours from now. So <laughs> since the time of Augustine, 1500 years, people are scratching their heads saying, what, what in the world does Cicero mean there at the mm -hmm. end of book three? How can that, how can that be? Now, I do understand that um, book three is, it's missing some pieces, Yes, right? most likely. So, yep. But not, not enough to, to um, kind of have us throw up our hands and say, we can't really know what's no, going on No, definitely here. not. Okay. It's far more complete than, say, his uh, De Republica or his De Legibus, gotcha. right? The, okay. Re the Republic or the Laws. All right. So there's a lot there that we can, uh, we can go by. Okay. We can go on. Mm -hmm. Now, do we want to take each of these arguments kind of one by one? Or? No, I think we should move a little more uh, herky jerky. Okay. Well, let's let's herky jerky. Where where, <laughs> are, we, right. where are we going with All this? Right. Yeah. So um, we should note that Cicero is consistent throughout this book, whether speaking in his own voice uh, or through the provisional representative Cotta. Okay. Right. When he when he is examining the Epicurean school, he ranks them on the lowest rung of the philosophical and dialectical ladders. Cicero presents a united front, both personally, so whenever he speaks, and through his academic spokesman. Okay. So Cicero is throughout the book until we get right up to the very end in the unusual part. Uh, he is very consistent. Okay. In, in his presentation of his ideas. When we get to the point about the existence of the gods, Cotta responds to Balba and says that he will always defend, this is really important, Cotta says he will always defend the opiniones, the sacra, the ceremonias, and the religiones that are received from the ancestors on Maioribus. Okay. All right. So that takes, uh, those cannot be meddled with. That's right. All right. And this is the first note we might uh, say, the first note we hear, that something is odd, right? Why would an academic say, look, uh, I I'm the Pontifex Maximus. I've not forgotten my responsibility. I will defend to the death these four aspects of Roman religion because we've got them from my Oribus. This is an argument to authority, mm -hmm. right? This is the same kind of ad auctoritatem argument that Cicero will criticize at the beginning of book one when he says, you know, the Pythagoreans... Uh, they just believe whatever Pythagoras says, ipsa dixit, right? Why do you think that? Mm, ipsa dixit. He said it, so it's got to be true. Hmm. Now in book three, we have Cotta, who is Cicero's rep, saying, mm, I'm never going to pick a fight with these aspects of, of Roman religion. They come from the ancestors. Well, this seems like a, uh, a, an odd take for an, an academic to... 
to hold, mm-hmm. isn't it? I mean, if if uh, if they're marked by kind of a, a, a skepticism or kind of an agnosticism across the board, why why such a why is this one place where they say, well, no, I'm not I'm I'm not moving mm-hmm. here. I won't question this. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does the question make sense? Well, does no does <clears throat> well does that make would that make sense for for an academic philosopher of this no. time and in, in era? No, no, except that he's a Roman. Okay. See, that's the distinction. Gotcha. Roman philosophy. We're anticipating the end a little bit, but Roman philosophy has to proceed along different lines than Greek philosophy. Okay. Because the appeal to re- to uh, authority trumps the appeal to reason among the Romans in a way that it doesn't among the Greeks. I right? see. So, so think about your own faith journey, mm-hmm. right? I'm not talking about Steve Perry and, you know, other... We can talk about Steve Perry. I would, love, I would love to another, another another time. But yeah. your own faith journey. Journey is a word people like to use a lot when it comes to describing their faith. Yep. I, I think it's one of those terms that is intended to be not too specific. Maybe you think yeah. people use the word journey so that they can they can al- allow other people room to have a differing interpretations. I think so. I think it's kind of it's a, it's like your it's your, it's like a softball pitch. You know, tell me okay. about your journey. You can. You All can, right. I'm, I'm I'm asking you to kind of talk about whatever you want to talk about. Okay. All right. So what's your faith journey, right? What, what's the relationship between um, reason and authority in your own development of whatever beliefs you hold to be true? Hmm. You want me to, to, to just I drop go, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. How did, how did this happen? Um, and you can turn it back on me, and then sure. we'll turn it to Cicero, of course. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, again, I don't want this to turn it just a kind of a, kind of a, just a broad confessional. No. Um, but, I mean, I would say— You got say, some things on your mind? Well, I mean, I think that my own faith journey has been kind of— uh, uh, kind of equal parts, kind of bouncing around, questioning a lot of things right. that um, that I grew up with. But at the end of the day, uh, coming around to see the value mm-hmm. of the traditions that I was that I grew up with and, and still hold. Not that I I, I completely have, um, you know, bought into kind of everything mm. uh, uh, rotely that was um, taught to me and mm-hmm. and that I was brought up with. But I it rests on the foundation that I was brought up. In. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about how about yourself, man? Well. Like most people, uh, as children, we believe what we're taught. Yeah. Right? Because there's a natural connection between children and their parents. There's this uh, this notion of trust. I heard someone describe it once as uh, your parents are kind of like gods in your house, right? They can make food appear magically. Right? Where did that come from? Mm-hmm. Right? Would you like an apple? Here's an apple, yeah. right? <laughs> right, right. These kinds, as a very young child, this is like magic. Mm-hmm. And if you have loving parents, as, as I'm blessed to have, you know, then that, that sense of um, attachment grows very strong. And it's not just limited to physical things, but what your parents think as well. Right. So like most people, my f- faith beliefs were formed largely, uh, at least as I experienced it, uh, by an appeal to authority. This right. is what we do. This is our family. This is what we believe. Now, as you grow and mature, you start to examine them. And I can remember examining them in some respects at a very young age, but not seriously till I was much older. Mm-hmm. I think eventually, for those who persist in the faith they were taught at their mother's knee, they have to stop um, using the appeal to authority uh, or transfer it to a, a different kind of authority. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so I believe the things that I do, not because my parents told me specifically, yeah. but because now the authority comes from another source. Right. You know, in some traditions, it's the voice of the church, and others, it's um, the voice of scripture or some other kind of thing. But I think that generally speaking, reason plays a subordinate role yeah. in all of this. Indispensable, but not primary. Did you did you go through a, a kind of a distinct uh, rebellious period in your life? I did, but I wasn't rebelling so much against the things I had been told. I, was, I think I was kind of more rebelling against what were some of the consequences of the things I had been told. Yeah. Right. If if I continue to believe these things, here here are some of the consequences that naturally follow. Yeah. I'm not sure I necessarily want those, but it wasn't sustained or very long. Gotcha. How about you? Yeah. I mean, it was never a. I mean, I went through a rebellious period, not in kind of the the cliched kind of teenage coming of age movie kind of. Yeah. Movie. It was never kind of like a, you know, a, a kind of a, a physical or kind of a cultural rebellion, but it was more kind mm. of Did a, you get a motorcycle. No, nothing like that. I mean, leather jacket. I, I had the most kind of the most nerdtastic moped you've ever seen in my life. <laughs> right. Um, and it was not a rebellion. If anything, that took me, that took me, um, uh, nerdtastic. It was very, ner- yeah, exactly. We can talk about that another day, but it was more like, you know, I got to a point, um, and it wasn't like during my teenage years, but it was when I was a bit older, kind of rejecting things, uh, almost kind of for the sake of rejecting them, right. burn, burning something to the ground and kind of having to rebuild it on my own. Right. It's and common. It is very common. Right. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing strange about that. Um, 
but you know, I, it's I think it's often accompanied with a more kind of like a. Um, you, know, you can't tell me what to do, mom and dad. Right. It, was, it was never like that. It was more kind of, you know, it was in my head. Is that 18 year old Winkle right there? Is that the voice we got? Right. It's, that was something like that. Okay. Right? Exactly. As I, you sc- can't tell me what, what to do. do. As, I, as I peeled out at two miles an hour on my uh, <laughs> my, J, my uh, Pinto moped made by J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I think I saw yeah. some pictures hanging around. But it was more like I, I kind of grew up and I realized that I, in my upbringing, I, I felt like there were some questions that. I wasn't supposed to ask. Or maybe they were avoided. They generally. were avoided. I think that's probably better. Mm-hmm. And then I, w- I wanted to ask them. Yeah, your mom and would I did. say, would you like it? You ask a difficult question and she offers you a Twizzler. Right, exactly. <laughs> Which I was more than happy to take. I like <laughs> I like a good, good Twizzler. Right. So what is the relationship? I guess that's the point here. Mm-hmm. What is the relationship between an appeal to authority and an appeal to reason? Mm-hmm. When it comes to the question of the God's existence. Right. The stan- just to try to clarify where we're going, the standard academic answer is reason alone is the bar for the making of such a decision. Right. And the Stoics, Epicureans, they don't sacrifice reason. They claim that their beliefs are fully rational, mm-hmm. but they also appeal to authority. Right which the academics are not supposed to do. Gotcha. Now, it strikes me that when we talk about, um, you know, the, these, these customs and rituals and rites of Roman religion, um, there is, certainly seems to be kind of an aspect, well, uh, why do we do these things? Well, it's because we've always done them. And, um, and I wonder if part of the, the power of that, uh, you know, a lot of the, what the Romans, they're just, what we would call kind of distinctly Roman religion, um, are built upon, you know, indigenous practice of the of the Italian people, mm. the um, the Etruscans and, and and the like. Well, because but, augury seems to have come from the Etruscans, is right, that right, 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 right. Um, and I wonder if some sense is that that kind of stuff goes so far back that you cannot you cannot uh, point to an origin. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think like with Greek philosophers, we can we can kind of point to and say, well, this kind of idea, this this kind of rationality, this approach to rationality started with this guy. Right. And but the kind of the religious practices of the Etruscans goes back into that kind of fog of prehistory. It's like mm. this is kind of it's autochthonous, mm-hmm. right? It comes from the ground oh, nice itself. Nice word. And um, and so therefore it has a power of its own because you can't point to its origin. Mm. I'm, I think that's is exactly right. Okay, all right, all right. And it's therefore accepted on on authority. Authority. Right. Hallowed antiquity. Yes. Right? Right. Yep. So um, as the book continues, and I'm going to be quoting a little bit here from some previous work of mine. So if it sounds like I'm reading something, Mm -hmm. I am. You are, right. (laughs) But it's mine. I wrote it. Okay. All right. Kata subjects the traditional Roman beliefs to exacting scrutiny on a wide range of topics, uh, from things like the holy sites of Regillus to divination. But he does so as a type of rational game. Now, I have to confess here, uh, I'm quoting from the the, uh, dissertation we referenced earlier. Mm Mm-hmm. I used the word construct in my dissertation. Oh, why, why would you do such a I thing? I don't know. The year was 2003. Oh. That's Con- almost 20 years ago. Construct was all the rage? Construct was everywhere. Right. I had a pair of construct jeans, didn't you? <laughs> I did, exactly. Oh, I wore them every day. <laughs> <laughs> but looking back, you know, in, in, with the benefit of hindsight and senescence and, you know, more uh, facial hirsitude, I, I got a beard. Yeah. I can see that... Um, the word construct does not belong in anybody's dissertation. It's one of those weasel words. It's so weaselly, yeah. right? So here we go. Within the confines of this construct, oh, it's bad academic prose. No, I, I blame your uh, your committee for that. They should take away my PhD. That. Yeah. The discussion proceeds by ratio. So it proceeds by a reason. Kata uses the academic method to refute most of what Balba said. But here's the shocking part. He's scrupulous at all points to affirm his belief in Roman religion. So there you have it. So this, no, is this Cotter or is this, is this Cicero? Yes. It's, it's both. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, all right. It's a both and. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Not a neither nor. For example, he says, while he's criticizing auguries from livers and raven song, he carefully confesses, nevertheless, I believe these things, right? Quibus ego credo. Th- these are the things I believe, right? Mm-hmm. But he bases it on an appeal to authority. Uh, the Roman uh, Atius Navius, right? Yeah. So it's, it's an appeal to authority. Okay. Now, there's a couple of ways to read this, right? One is a very cynical way. And this, I would say, is the prevailing interpretation from antiquity. This is the part that uh, bedeviled the patristics. Because Cotta is Cicero's spokesman, maybe Cicero is just saying this because he's secretly, he's secretly an atheist or a full-blown, you know, a skeptic or a full-blown atheist. 
but he's got to pretend to subscribe to Roman religion because that's what everybody in his generation did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these these superstitions of birdsong and looking at chicken livers or things like that. Uh, that's just for the masses, right? So this is he's got to he's got to he's got to do the dance because this is what the rubes want to see. Yes. Well, we could cite contemporary political speeches and so forth, almost all of which end with "God bless this or that country." Right? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to ask? Do those persons really believe in the deity that they are um, invoking? Mm -hmm. I don't think we're supposed to ask that. It's it's just boilerplate. Right. Right. I mean, I even see that in just in. Um, in uh, kind of references to uh, the Constitution. Oh, yeah. Or the, the, the founding fathers. You're going to go political here? I'm not. I, uh, um, I, stop me if I do. Um, oh, I'll stop you. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think these things are also kind of um, under, under attack to some degree as well. Yeah. But that kind of the use of um, the, quoting the Constitution or referring to the founding fathers as, as an argument from authority. They right. said that, therefore, you don't right. question it. Right, right. Uh, yes, very uh, selectively, I yes. suppose. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. But was it Eisenhower who said uh, the American people are very religious, and it doesn't matter which one? <laughs> yeah. Words that, to that effect. Eisenhower? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah. very, very close. Hmm. Are very religious people, and it doesn't really matter which one. Right. 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 So that's kind of this cynical. So that's the one interpretation. Cicero's spokesman Cotta, and in fact Cicero himself, consistently in the dialogue, all three books. Supports Roman religion. Why does he do that? Well, it could just be it's in his interest. Mm -hmm. The other explanation is he's functioning along uh, a different set of uh, with a different set of arguments than uh, his Greek predecessors. Reason is not the standard for making the decision. It's actually authority. Okay. 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 So something can be a prima facie irrational, but if authority tells you, so what? And we we don't see this amongst the Greeks. We do not see this among the Greeks. There's no, there, uh, there's no kind of a appeal to some kind of, uh, uh, this is the way we've always done it kind of authority. Not, a, not in Greek philosophy, mm -hmm. I, I would say, except the examples that we've cited, um, a, an individual sage, right, an individual sapiens like um, Pythagoras, we can appeal to his personal authority. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that it's based on the fact that he has arrived at some special knowledge that's rationally demonstrable. Hmm. So Pythagoras knows the, knows the score. He's gone through the syllogisms. He's completed the exercises in the back of the book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now he's the one that knows, right? right. Um, just like if I go to the doctor, right, and I have a little bit of a different opinion on something, that toe should be removed, right? <laughs> and he says that toe should not be removed. You really want it removed. No, I don't. You don't, no. no. Uh, but if he says it should not be, I, I defer to his authority not simply because he's the doctor. yeah. But because he's supposed to have a degree in toectomies or something, right? Right, right, right. He's right. done the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not even getting a smile. There's no such thing as a toectomy. <laughs> I'm sure it's been done. All right. Yeah. Um, I got to think that uh, uh, you, you are right with kind of continuing kind of the Greek versus Roman. Yes, uh, but I don't claim to be such an authority well, that no, I, everything I, I say is, you know. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm just, I, I, Curious, I, I, these thoughts jumped in my mind, and yep. I, want, I want your opinion. All right. Now, in Cicero's day, uh, we weren't quite at Rome; wasn't quite at empire status, but it was expanding, and, and um, yes. there was kind of this notion of um, kind of a spreading uh, Romanness throughout the Mediterranean. For sure. And compare that to uh, you know the the zenith of the of the of the of the Greek world, where right. you know Athens is kind of at the top right. of the heap, much more fragmented. Right, it was absolutely. It, it was a many more, you know, city state and city. They all had their own customs, right, dialects, for sure. and laws. And I wonder if that this uh, this idea that Roman religion is kind of a binding thing that binds not just it's not just about Rome. It's about everything that's being kind of, um, uh, you know, falling under this larger growing umbrella of Rome. That's also kind of part of the appeal here, or part of the purpose that the Rome the Greeks just didn't have that uh, kind of that that empire sure. view of things. Right. So this is going to my answer will be a little bit speculative, but I think that. So far as I understand it, what you say is absolutely correct. The whole notion of being Greek, of a Pan-Hellenism, mm -hmm. is a foreign kind of idea that arose primarily because of external pressure. When the Persians start to um, bump up against the Greeks, suddenly you can think of yourself as not so much an Athenian, not so much a Corinthian or Theban, something like that, but yeah. as a Greek, right? Mm -hmm. We're united by the Homeric epics. We're united by a roughly... 
uh, identical pantheon. Yes. And so people like Demosthenes, his uh, panhellenism is here it's in opposition to Philip and the Macedonians. Exactly. And uh, but by the time we get to Cicero's uh, era, the Greeks are highly fragmented, right? There's there's no more sense of national identity than I'm aware of. Right, 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 they're, right. They're running on fumes. Right? Yes. We've got a great language, but even all the luminaries that are thought of as quintessentially Greek, a lot of them are primarily Athenian. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that the Corinthians, you know, thought of themselves as uh, children of Socrates. No, not at all. By no. any stretch. I would totally agree with that. And even if you look at, um, you know, Pan-Hellenic sanctuaries and festivals... They weren't really the, the they weren't really designed to kind of bring the Greeks together. No, if you think about the the ancient Olympics, it's right. it's still city states going head to head. Yes, representing very parochial interests. Right, and you're you're kind of doing war in a more friendly way. Yeah, and if you look at like oracle sites like Dodona and Delphi, um, there was nothing that you kind know, of brought the Greeks there together um, aside from just kind of a shared belief in what the function of this oracle was. It was right. still very individual. Much of the notion of a shared Hellenic culture is really late, Yeah, I think it's fair to say. The language is common, although there's lots of dialect variations. The pantheon is more or less the same, but each city-state had its own divinity, which competed against the others. Right. So it is quite different than Rome, for sure. Sure, right. And, and if we think about you know, the, modern, the modern country of Greece, uh, only in effect since uh, 1825 or mm-hmm. so, um, that notion of kind of a unified Greek city-state, even under Alexander... Right. Um, uh, n- nothing like it was in antiquity. No. Yeah. So Rome, right, the the Roman miracle goes from a, a tiny little village on the banks of the Tiber to eclipsing all of Italy eventually and then a lot of Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had to roll along with a lot of uh, assumptions about a unified culture. Right. And that's what Cicero is representing. And these, these, these ancient religious rites, um, I think, are... Strike at the heart of that. Definitely. Now, right. now, maybe if we had a better historical record of all of those indigenous peoples, the dozens of little tribes on the Italian peninsula whom the Romans subsumed, mm-hmm. if we had a little better knowledge of that, maybe the picture would look more like what we've just described with respect to the Greeks. Right. But we don't have that. that right. Those gaps in our, in our knowledge. We don't have, right. the, we don't have the things uh, that give that point of view. Right, but and it, but I think also kind of this notion of um, you know as Rome grows the, of conferring citizenship on these you know conquered peoples or you know or, or Caesar's notion of, of clemency. Right, it comes with kind of an expected okay. Now you you buy into this. Right, right. That you oh, buy absolutely. into this. Yeah, it's a, it's a gift, but it's also it comes with a pressure to to buy into all this, this shared culture and this shared this this long uh, history. Yeah, you have to give up the worship of your gods, or at least not treat the worship of your gods as more important more important than yeah. the gods of the Roman state. Yes, and I don't think there is a clear analog among the Greeks. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. Mm-hmm. So, um, as as Cotta attacks the Olympian deities, as he does in Book Three, he mm-hmm. attacks a sustained attack on the Olympian and other deities. He even attacks some Eastern and specifically Roman deities. But he prefaces all of that uh, with a comment that this is interesting. He has gained better information. Meliora made it a kiss. They have taught me better how to worship the gods. The little pots, the little clay pots left behind by Numa, what are called the Cappadunkula. Oh, I like that. Cappadunkula. Cappadunkula, yeah. yeah. You know the uh, Washington football team? Yes. Recently took on a new um, mascot. The, the Commanders? The Commanders. It's did terrible. you read any of the description for why? I did not. On? I didn't. I just saw the logo and I yeah, thought Yeah, I read awful. it in the newspaper. I agree. <laughs> they took it on because Washington, D.C. is a center of uh, political leadership. Therefore, they're going to call themselves the Washington Commanders. I think this is a huge miss. Hmm. Do you think the majority of the country, other than those living in Washington, D.C., want to think of themselves as commanded <laughs> no, by Washington, D.C.? No, not D. at all. It's very myopic. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's terrible. And so yeah. the, the football team, we know you're not a footballer, but yeah. the football team represented by the nation's capital called the Commanders, I'm rooting against them just on that basis alone. Yeah. You know, I really liked Washington football team. It was pretty good. I like that. Woofed. Exactly. But beyond that... I think the Cappadunculas would have been much better. Oh, my gosh. The Washington Cappadunculas? Yeah, the little pots. I would have bought the t-shirt. Exactly. So Cotta says, I've gained better knowledge about the gods from the Cappadunculla, the little pots left behind by Numa, and from the the Mosmaiorum, than from all the arguments of the Stoics. Hmm. 
strange appeal to authority. It is a really strange coming from the mouth of an academic. Right now, yeah. can you share a little bit, or can we share a little bit with the audience? Numa, who's Numa? Numa is he's one of the kind of the uh, kind of the prime ancestors yes. of of of, uh, of Rome, right? Yes, there's some it's, kind of mnemonic device. Uh, ramen noodles toss and turn save them. What I've never heard. You don't of this. know this? No. It's the way to remember the seven kings of Rome. Okay. Romulus, Numa, and then I forgot. It's all noodles after that. <laughs> But Numa is the second one. So he's going back to the the eighth century. Correct. Yes. And Numa is the um, quintessential lawgiver. Right. Mm, right, right. Numa right. is the Hammurabi, the Moses, the Confucius of the Romans. Yeah. And Kata says, "Look, you can get better knowledge about how to worship the gods from the the little Cappadocia that Numa left us somewhere in the city of Rome, mm-hmm. than from all the reasons and arguments of the Stoics." And and uh, with that, you said there's he's uh, it's a rejection of the Olympian deities. So it's, it's, again, a, it's it, a criticism of them. So it's a bit of a, a kind of a chin flip to again to the Greeks, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's like, that you know what? Yeah, because well, as most people know, the the Romans incorporated a lots of the the Greek pantheon into their own, um, but they had this uh, much more kind of in, these indigenous ties to these uh, uh, to the the uh, Mos Maiorum that we're talking yeah. about here, right? Chin flip? Uh, you know, well, rather, you know. That's a new one for me. You're just, you're just full of new English interesting phrases well, it's, tonight. It's, you know, it's the Italian finger, right? Oh, oh okay. Right. So it's like, you think, yeah, like Serpent that. under the flower, that was one? Yes, the serpent, uh, yes. She, she appeareth the innocent flower, but tis the serpent under it. Oh, interesting. And yeah. now the chin flip. Yeah. Right. That's what it is. Yep. So we also, I guess we could add to our interpretation a third possibility, right? Okay. It's it's not um, a kind of pragmatic belief in the gods to hide an actual atheism. Second, maybe it's not um, because the Romans actually value authority more than reason. Maybe it's the third one. He's just kind of poking fun at the Greeks. This is just national pride. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which the Romans, you know, have a lot of. Sure, right. I mean, I think that's a very human kind of thing. That, oh, it I, is. You know, um, how does one justify one's patriotism? Right. It often comes with these kind of appeals to authority, right? Oh, yeah. 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 As, uh, I mean, in America, we, we tend to think of things to have happened 200 years ago as being ancient. Absolutely. But these, these kinds of things go way, way, way back. Definitely. Right? So I like that idea that they're okay. kind of poking at the... Uh, poking at the Greeks. Yeah. Speaking of poking at the Greeks. Yes. I think we should take some time now to uh, plug some products. And we're going to poke at the Greeks by doing no, that? No, it was <laughs> a very lame attempt at a segue. Gotcha. Uh, didn't right. work. Let's get to it. This episode... Yeah. Of ad nauseum mm-hmm. is brought to you. To you? To you. To all of you. By... By who? Racial Coffee. Racial Coffee. Tell us about Racial Coffee, Dave. Well, I have known Mark Helweg, the founder of Racial Coffee, since the year 2000. Okay, that's a long time. It's a long time. So that was before you wrote this dissertation about Cicero? Exactly. Wow. Yes, and while my dissertation may have grown stale, (laughs) the coffee Mark produces is very fresh. It's very true, right? So Mark moved around the country, and then he uh, landed on this fantastic entrepreneurial idea, Mm -hmm. which is let's make a premium home coffee machine. Mm Mm-hmm. You go to uh, one of those uh, bakery, beagley, barneries? The, bar- the barneries that have, right, that right. have the, the, brew, the brew barns. What do they typically do? They The nice ones set out on their uh, butcher block counter a number of different carafes with some kind of conical pour-over device on the top. That's true. Yeah, And it makes a good cup of coffee. Yeah, usually. There's, there's one here in Grand Rapids over on... Uh, Michigan Avenue. You ever been over there? I but I go up and down that street. Okay, yeah, yeah, there you yeah. go. Good coffee. But what if you want to bring that into your home and you don't want the fuss and the muss? What are you going to do? You, this is where you pick up either the ratio six or the ratio eight. Yes. Now, word on the street is some of the silly banter we use during the ads. Mm-hmm. Maybe the jokes are getting a little bit old. Really? Are we going to try to rectify that now? Or are we just no, I do don't this, think so. We're going to do the same old shtick. <laughs> Let's adopt like a six-month plan. All right. <laughs> Well, I have the six. Okay, let's hear. And you have the eight. I have the eight. It's right. two ratios better. Yep. I, I have never had a machine like this before in my no. life. Right. Um, I had, before this, I had the uh, the the senior beanery, the Dakin Blecker, the Dakin Blecker with mm-hmm. the with the roasting pan beneath it. Right. And I thought this this is as good as it got. I liked how you didn't say scorch pad. <laughs> So we're doing the old jokes, but we're changing. Okay, them. gotcha. There's right. a kind of a tackish brang. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> oh, <Winkle>. oh man. <laughs> no, so, in, in my machine, I have never, I have never noticed the tackish brain. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't either. Right. Everything Every day, has been as fresh, mm-hmm. as fresh as the jokes we use to present this material. <laughs> That's right. That's you right. You grind the beans. You grind the beans. Do you have a little bean grinder? I do. Okay. Yep. You put them in the cone. Yep. You slide it onto the ratio eight in my case. Yes. And there's nothing underneath to keep it hot. No. There is a little sensor, however, that tells the machine the pot's in place. It's time to brew. That's right. And so then you go through your three stages. That's right. Right. You get the you get the bloom stage. The bloom. Yep. There's no serpent under that flower. No, not at all. <laughs> there's the brew. The brew. Which I would argue is the most important stage. I think if you if you don't have brew, then it just won't do. It just won't do. <laughs> and then. It's ready. It's ready. It's ready. You pour it off. You pour it off. Delicious cup of coffee. Exactly. I was skeptical. So you don't, with no burning thing beneath it, how is it going to stay warm? But the carafe does the job. It does. Yes. It's vacuum sealed. It's double walled. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's a tiny little technician in there who's lighting matches all the time, keeping it warm. I don't, I, frankly, I don't even want to know. It's you magical. Don't know. It's it magical. Is. So, so after having said all that... <laughs> Maybe you, the listener, are wondering when is that sweepstakes going to end and we're going to find out which of us won a brand new Ratio 6. Right. And I believe we said it was going to be today, but it's... it's we can't trust us. We can't trust us. It, Who uh, can trust us? Uh, it, episode 74. 74 is it. Yep. We're finally... And you know, you might think, I'm so tired of waiting, but listener, viewer, this is really in your interest. You have one more opportunity. Go to RatioCoffee.com slash ANCO and enter the secret coupon code. It's 6567. 6567. And you'll be signed up. Maybe you just want to buy a coffee machine outright. Mm-hmm. So if you go to RatioCoffee.com uh, right. and in the coupon code box, you type in ANCO, you I get believe. 15% off. Yes. And that's the six or the eight. And if you are one of those loyal listeners, how grateful we are for you, who have already purchased a ratio, we'd like you to send us some comments. Maybe there's something you'd like us to read on the air to dislodge the tackish brang. <laughs> send it along. We'll read it and then make fun of you. Yeah. Uh, let, let us know what you what you love about it and uh, because we're desperate for material here. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to ratio, this episode is brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Yes. Hackett Publishing um, in business for, I think, over 50 years now. This is the 50th year right now. Right now. We're in the 50th year uh, based in Indianapolis and also Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, They've been in the business of uh, uh, making excellent translations from works across the classical uh, canon to uh, many other places in in academia. There's, I mean, there's stuff in in Asian history and philosophy. Latin America. Yeah. Anything that you want. Buddhism, anything you could want. Fine quality material. And just this week, I was promoting Hackett, as is my want, Mm -hmm. to those who are taking my uh, Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata class. And that text is published by Hackett, That's the one. And they said, oh, I'm going to buy the text. I said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. No, wait, wait, wait. Right. Right. Don't go to that river-themed supply house. No. Go to Mm hackettpublishing.com, and you can get 20% off and free shipping. That's right. Um, And uh, with the coupon code, I believe, is... N two zero two two. Yeah, N two zero two two. I'm sensing a pattern because not too long ago it was N two zero two one. That's right. Right. So who knows where this is going? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they had an extensive catalog. I've used their stuff in my classes all the time. We, we know, Jeff. Right. Well, we know. Okay. It's in your glove box. Yeah. It, we it, know. It, there is a copy of it in my That's glove right. box. Right. So by whom is this episode also brought to listeners and viewers? By the Gold River um, Trading Company. That's right. Yes. And uh, their excellent tea. Uh, this morning, uh, actually yesterday morning, I had some of their green tea. And? It was great. Did it, did it agree with you? It did very much agree with me. You know, green tea is supposed to be very good for you. Yes. It's supposed to help with Antioxidants. Your antioxidants. It's supposed to do all kinds of wonderful things you inside your to, body. You don't need to talk about that at no, any point no. right now. <laughs> Were there any fannings or little pieces of dust in your tea satchel? Yes, of course. That's no, a, there weren't. There weren't? you got to read the ad copy. No. Uh, it was fanning <laughs> free. <laughs> Many tea producers, yeah. so I'm told, just put a dustpan and a broom on the floor of their warehouse, and whatever they sweep up goes down into their, I don't know, rhomboid-shaped tea satchels. Not yeah. these guys. Well, I, I assume Gold River just did that, too. No, no, no. Oh, they no. go out, and they get the best-sourced tea, and they put them in pyramidal satchets. Yes. I love the shape. Yeah, you can, and the packaging generally is amazing. Oh my God, it, I don't even want to open it. Cause Have it, you it, tried it, the cacao? I have not tried the cacao. I've tried the green and the black. You're in for a real treat with the cacao. Really? Yes, it's fresh. Is it chocolatey? It is chocolatey, but I wouldn't say it's Miss Swissy. <laughs> <laughs> you going to be all right? 
Uh, right. So, yeah, we want to avoid the Miss Swissy at all we costs. We do. Right, right. But we do want you, loyal listener, avid tea drinkers? Tea drinker to go to goldriverco.com, goldriverco.com. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Enter the coupon code, something Jeff thought up, A N T E A. Yes. Up the ante. Up the ante. That's yep. right. That's ad nauseum tea. That's right. Yep. And you're going to get 10% off any order. Some quality material. Check it out. Don't miss it. So, Dave, as we get back into it, mm-hmm. uh, we're getting towards the end here, Yes, right? we are. All right. So what, what, what should we focus on here? What's, okay. what's the last of these arguments? Well, remember that the fourth and most controversial claim that the Stoics make in book two is that the gods care for the human race. Right. Deus generi humano consulere. Mm-hmm. That the gods care for the human race. Kata is going to go right at this. Okay. He's going to aim at it like a rubber bullet from a dart gun. <laughs> At a paper target. Okay, that sounds pretty... That's pretty bad. Pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. His attack on divine providence, mm-hmm. for those of you who are reading along at home, begins in section 78 and doesn't end until section 93. We're going to read a little snippet of 93 when we get there. Okay. But it's a sustained attack. And then Kata breaks off suddenly. So what's he doing for all these these sections here? Yes, yeah, so it's a standard argument from the evil evident in the world. It's a standard argument. Pitting yeah. the gods' omnipotence against their omniscience. Now, those of you who are students of philosophy in the Western tradition, whether serious or casual, you may think that, well, I guess only the casual ones would think this, that arguments against the existence of the Christian God, for example, are recent and Mm. somehow devastating. Well, they may be devastating, I don't think so, but they're definitely not recent. Right. The the non-Christian theists also attacked their gods for allowing evil into the world. Right. Now, right now I'm I'm teaching a, uh, a world religions class and we talk about kind of issues of, you know, kind of truth claims and right. the like. And uh, what I found from uh, from each time that I've taught this class is that for the students who really struggle with kind of the notion of faith, right? Uh, the biggest stumbling block is why do bad things happen to good people? Yes, over and over again. Sure. And that this is a this is an element of the same thing. Yeah. And this is how Kata develops it. He says that the ratio, the reason of the Stoics, doesn't actually eventuate. It's a good dissertation word, right? Eventuate. <laughs> eventuate. Yeah. It doesn't bring about absolute and complete wisdom for anybody. Okay. So the Stoics uh, are united in saying no really wise man has ever existed. The Sapiens. Mm. We're all looking for the Sapiens, the wise man, right? Right. Just like I'm always looking for the perfect chicken sandwich. Have you right? found it? No. No. <laughs> Have you tried the Popeyes? Uh, no, I've heard so, such wonderful things about it. I have I've, too. I've never tried it. Though. Chick-fil-A is good. Chick-fil-A is good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, they never have actually found the Sapiens. No one ever gets complete and absolute wisdom. The Stoics claim, well, hey, it's possible. It's possible that you can attain perfect wisdom. And Kata says, well, that's no consolation, right? Lots of things that are possible, if they don't actually happen, how's that good for me? Hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That seems like a pretty telling criticism. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? I, yeah, definitely. Right. right, right. So, I, I mean, I was so unaware of that. So, the, there is the stoic claim that you, that uh, kind of perfect wisdom can be achieved. It's achievable. Okay. Now, nobody has, right? Yes. Some have gotten pretty close. You know, the stoic heroes, the Hall of Fame. These would be people like uh, Chrysippus and Zeno himself. Right. right. But um, they don't they don't claim anyone's actually gotten it. So if the gods care for mankind, mm-hmm. right, if it's true that Deus generi humano consulare, they ought to have caused at least one individual to attain complete wisdom. Oh, okay. Since the mere possibility of someone doing so produces no measurable advantage. Aha. Uh-huh. The okay. gods really care for us. Give us an example. Right. right. Now, Christian apologists have a field day with this, right? Because what happened about 40 years ago, Christ was born, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So th- they would see this as strongly anticipating. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So yeah. this is an attack on the Stoic account of the Sapiens. Mm. The gods did not, Kata claims, make all men good, didn't even protect the interests of those who are good, because the morally good do not invariably receive good things. The morally good often have the short stick in life. Right, right, you right. You can even make a pretty persuasive argument that to be morally good uh, is a huge disadvantage. Right, right, yeah, exactly. But, th- but this is kind of the, I mean, what Kata's arguing against is kind of the, uh, uh, kind of God as vending machine, right? You, yes. You put, in, you put in good moral tokens and you get your, your Twizzler pack out of That's the bottom. That's right. right. I was going to say something like a Porsche. A Porsche? Yeah, have you seen the Cayenne 
It's a Porsche SUV, I believe. I have not seen this. Have you heard of the Cayenne? I didn't, I didn't know Porsche made SUVs. I didn't it's an know, SUV-ish kind of thing. Yeah. You, you mean you don't read cars while you're driving? I don't. I don't I don't, I don't. don't think about cars at all. Oh, wow. As long as mine's running, I'm happy. All right. Yes. <laughs> so you put in your tokens and you get out the Porsche, you get the, the, Porsche. the Cayenne. Yeah, it's okay. kind of an SUV thing. Yeah. So these examples show, right, that the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Mm-hmm. So he says, Kata says, I'm not going to lend any credence, this is in section 85, uh, to the idea aspects of the complex Stoic system, right? Okay. Because it's just not there. It's not going to happen. All right. So how do we reconcile Kata's extended attack on providence? Because that's what really it's an argument about, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. With the unswerving trust in Roman religious authorities. Okay. Are you going to break that down for us? Yeah, because we said to remember that the, the Cappadunculae, yeah, exactly. the little clay pots, mm-hmm. Of Numa, they're better than the Stoic arguments. So, how do we um, how do we, we put how do this we together? We those two together. Okay, all right. Right. One reason is that in Book Three, Kata never explicitly and precisely states what the Roman religious authorities are teaching. Okay. Right. So you got the Cappadunculae. Yep. And a couple of other things, but Roman religion is notoriously undogmatic. So this is kind of a good way to say, well, yeah, I affirm the religion. So long as there are no follow-up questions, right? <laughs> well, it's more of, of the, it's the performing of the ritual. It's the, exactly. That's what takes care of it. There's no kind of theological argument on the other side of that. There's not... Uh, other than that, the gods exist. And if you don't do this, you're in trouble. But there's no, and and this is then how you shall live on no. the other side of it, right? No, the ethics doesn't really follow right. at all. Right, right, right. It's, it, it, to my knowledge, it's entirely uh, ritualistic. Right. Okay, so... We're, I think we're, we're getting up against it here. Yes. So yep. where does, how does we're, this... We're drawing, we're drawing it down. We're getting close to the end. Okay. Right? And so here we have to look at section 95. Section right. 95 is the very end of book three. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you've uh, you've come with us through all three episodes and you're here near the end, we just got to say for the record, this is a, a rich and extended uh essay, these three books, we haven't really done it justice. There's a, there's a ton more, of course, that we, we skipped over. But of course. Uh, yes. But here we get right to the end, and I'm going to read a little bit of the Latin, okay. the concluding remarks between the Balbus and Cata, and we'll get to that um, that bewildering, bedeviling statement of Cicero uh, about uh, Cata and the Stoics. Yes. All right. Tum Cata, ego vero et opto redargui me balbe, et ea quae disputavi disserere malawi quam judicardre, et facile me ate winki possa certe scio, quippa inquit valeus, qui etiam somnia putet, ad nos miti abioe, quae ipsa tamen iam levia non sunt quam est stoacordrum de natura de ordrum oratio, haec cum essent dicta, ita discessimus. Ut vileo cata disputatio verior, mihi balbi ad veritatis similitudinem videretur esse propensior. All right, should we get Rackham's take Let's on that? Let's hear Rackham's translation. I on my side, replied Cata, only desire to be refuted. My purpose was rather to discuss the doctrines I have expounded than to pronounce judgment upon them. And I am confident that you can easily defeat me. Oh, no doubt, interposed Vileus. Why, he thinks that even our dreams are sent to us by Jupiter though dreams themselves are not so unsubstantial as a stoic disquisition on the nature of the gods. Here the conversation ended and we parted, Valeus thinking Cata's discourse to be the truer, while I felt that of Balbus approximated more nearly to a semblance of the truth. Hmm. So Cicero comes down with, with, the Bal- stoic. with the Stoics. Yeah. And Cata, his representative, right, mm-hmm. goes for the Epicurean side. Right. Very, that's, there's your there's your big twist. Yeah, that's the big twist. Now, why does he do this? Well, a couple of possibilities. One is, don't forget, this is a dramatic uh, recounting of an actual historical conversation. Mm-hmm. I think that Cicero is probably playing loose with the history, but for dramatic effect, maybe he has the surprise twist to keep us interested. Hmm. His purpose is not merely to instruct, it's to entertain, right? Yes. Like this podcast. Right. Right, but I mean, this, the 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 fact that he's that he ultimately sides with Balbus. I mean, that's more than just kind of uh, a gotcha at the end. That, I mean, that's right. That's a uh, that's seeing something very personal. That's right. Yeah. So the two conclusions that Cicero gives: the first one, Valeus' statement that he sides with Cotta. I think we can just set that aside, right? Okay. The other one, uh, Cicero saying that Balbus's statement seems to have more similitude, ad veritatis similitudinem. Mm-hmm. This is really interesting. This is an endorsement of Stoic providence. Right. This yes. is an endorsement of the Deus Genere Humano Consulare. Yes, right? but, yes, yes. But, but it's put in academic terminology. So I think that this is the one that's probably true. So why does he do that? 
Well, I think that uh, if if we're again, talking all about you know the Mas Maiorum and the you know the, mm-hmm. the rituals of Roman religion, um, I think it that goes much better with with Balbus's idea of kind of gods that are personally interested in human beings than what Velleius uh, has to say or or some kind of um, you know academic uh, skepticism. Right. It's it's almost as if like the 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 Roman religious ritual part takes care of kind of the uh, the the necessary acts that you have to do to kind of keep the. Uh, the Pax Deorum, the you know the peace That's of right. the gods, and the Stoic kind of argument kind of takes it, makes it much more kind of on a, on a personal side. You know, ha- you know, having done the correct rituals, the gods care for us. Right. So don't those seem to be kind of a nice two nice halves of a of a larger whole? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's really really well put. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. So Cicero's intellectual versatility, we could say, allows him to showcase the academic version of reason in ND three. So he's Cicero is you know able to show look. Uh, I can present all sides well, and the academics have a good basis for their reason. But at the end here, right, he's disinclined towards its conclusions. He says, well, I actually think Balbus and the Stoics are closer to the truth. So how could he do this? Well, he identifies nature with reason. Mm -hmm. And as we saw at the very beginning of the book, uh, nature is benevolent. And so long as nature is leading us, we go toward this conclusion, there are gods. I got you. That's where it heads. All right, all right. And he seems to believe that without the traditions of the ancestors, the state would soon collapse, right? And this is why Kata is frequently appealing to the auctoritas maiorum, right? The authority uh, of the ancestors. That's where it all rests. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous. But um, before we get out of here, I have right. to ask: Do you know? Do you know something about um, you know the afterlife, that the Nachleben, if you if you uh, if, if you don't mind, a little uh, German of this text? Oh yeah, it's yes. very influential on all subsequent teleological arguments for the gods' existence. Okay. Uh, read by Lactantius, who wrote the Divine Institutes and the De Opificio Dei, God's Workshop. Um, also read by Augustine, read um, very avidly in the Renaissance. So early Christians jumped on this. Oh, they love this. They loved it, and yeah. there are some great arguments in here, some we didn't touch. For example, do you know why your nose is right next to your mouth? No. It's so that you can smell your food before you eat it. Well, that makes sense. Do you know why your, um, I'm going to try to be delicate here, this yeah. is a family show. Yeah. Your consuming apparatus and your eliminating apparatus are on opposite ends of your body. Why is that? Because you don't want them close together. <laughs> I assume you don't want to consume and, um, I don't know, eliminate in, this, yeah. in the same neighborhood. So this is an argument from design. Exactly. Gotcha. And there are many, many like this in the book. We talked about the dragonfly last time. That's right. Or maybe two times ago. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the world is put together. And Cicero and the Stoics, Cicero here is just uh, imitating, representing Stoic ideas. They were the first ones outside of the Christian scriptures uh, to recognize these things. Hmm. And even the Christian scriptures, I would say, with all due respect, don't develop these kinds of arguments. Mm -hmm. They state some of them, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. Right. But there is no extended argument. And Mm. here it is all laid out, you know, in a pagan author, uh, one with beautiful, uh, limpid, right, Latin. And so the work has been extraordinarily popular. So guys like Tertullian and Lactantius and Augustine took took these these uh, these uh, ideas yeah. and then and merged them with uh, a Christian worldview. That's right. Okay. Yep. With the statements in Scripture that say this is the truth. So I want to close with two things. Please. Uh, one is a little bit self indulgent. Oh, and it, I go right ahead. All right. Yeah. The first one is from our friend Werner Jaeger, and it's an it's a nice colophon, a nice conclusion to the, all three episodes. He says, "For the Greek." The discovery of a contradiction between tradition and reason, between nomos and phusis, would itself involve normally a decision in favor of reason. For to him, that is to the Greek, reason represents nature, the only truth and necessity, whereas Roman conservatism rejects the uninhibited use of this criterion, because, the criterion being reason, that would require the sacrifice and devaluation of some piece of long-established experience." So there it is. There, there it is. There it is. Yeah. That's the difference, right? The, Why don't you say the it? The Greeks follow uh, reason. Right. And the Romans uh, ultimately follow tradition. Right. Yes. Okay. So here then the self-indulgent conclusion, okay. right? To quote myself here. Throughout his philosophical works, Cicero criticizes the Stoics for their paradoxical position on this, the trust in nature, that progress and wisdom as well cannot make a person wise, and therefore all men are unhappy. In trying to find an alternative to this idea, Cicero ends up stepping across the rift in his own thought from professed academism to Stoic natura. So in the end, 
Cicero sides with nature. Nature. Because that's where everything leads, including Roman tradition, the gods exist, uh, ipso facto. All tidied up with a nice bow on top. Fantastic. So that's how you that's how you ended your own study of this. Of yes, this that's right. Work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That's a perfect period at the end of this uh, at this end of this three parter. Yeah, it's this three parter. Yep. So we got to get out of here, don't we? We do. So we got some people to thank. Who should we thank? I think we should thank Agricola first and foremost. Yes. Our videographer. Do we? Do we? Yeah. He skulks around. Do we? Do, do we trust skulking? Him? I saw What's a little skulking today. What he's trying to do. Yeah. I think Jeff, if yeah. you'll just be charitable for a moment, I will try. Okay. He's trying to be inconspicuous. Is that what that is? Yet not okay. obsequious. Okay. Take it all back. He's trying to, you know, make sure that the video edition we get out there is um, palatable, you yes. might say. And he's done excellent work he, so far. Excellent work. That's yes, right. We need to thank Mishka, the sound engineer, puts this all together. Yep. Uh, the gentleman that provide the intro and outro and bumper music, Mr. Scott, Scott Van Zandt. Scott Van yep. And uh, thanks to Ken Tamplin as well mm-hmm. um, for, for his contributions. Have you watched any of the singers now and then? Oh, my. I, I love that. Yeah. I'm did you watch addicted. Michael Jackson? I, wa- I didn't watch. I, wa- I saw David Lee Roth. Yeah. Anne Hart. Uh, uh, I'm Hart. sorry. Anne Wilson from Anne Wilson from And uh, Bon Jovi. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Um, Not that I know anything about pop culture. But, but uh, yeah, go ahead and check out Ten, Cam- uh, Ten Camplin. <laughs> Ken Tamplin and his vo- uh, Vocal Academy. Great stuff. Yes, that's right. Um, hey, uh, we want to hear from you guys. Tell us what you uh, love about uh, the um, the products. If you're buying from Ratio or Hackett, um, tell us uh, who you are. If you want a shout out, uh, drop a note to Dave at ad nauseum, uh, don't forget, dot com. Don't forget the V or to Jeff at ad nauseum dot com. Also, don't forget the V. And Jeff, what are we going to deal with next week? What are we serving up? What's going to oh, go on the plate? It's one of my favorite little vignettes from ancient history, and it's uh, uh, the uh, another vignetti. It's another vignetti. All right. It's uh, uh, the the fasting Elsa. Biodies, kind of the boy wonder right. of a uh, kind of classical... The yeah, late 5th century. Late 5th century. And he got into a, a big pot of trouble. He was on the verge of, of leading this uh, mm. this uh, naval expedition against Sicily. Right. And he did some very naughty things. He got into a big pot of trouble, he, a kind of a cappadunculum. He did. He got himself stuck inside a cappadunculum. Right. And he profaned these sacred mysteries. And uh, even though he was set to lead this expedition, uh, he was run out of town. Wow. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fast road out of town on a rail. Peek into um, uh, political intrigue, right. religious intrigue in the fifth century BC. Looking forward to it. Alcibiades yep. and the profaning of the mysteries. Yep. You can also check out mossmethod.com. You want to learn a little bit of Greek? Yeah. How would I do that? Oh, you go to mossmethod.com okay. and learn a little bit of Greek. Oh, that's okay. It can take you from... <laughs> uh, neophyte. To erudite. Yes. And Jeff, you have the gustatory parting shot. I love this. Let's hear it. I do. This comes from a one Alisi Harrison from a book called Monster High. She writes, a burrito is a delicious food item that breaks down all social barriers <laughs> and leads to temporary spiritual enlightenment. That's great. Thanks for that listening. that was a nice, nice dovetail with our, our topic today. Spiritual so you're putting a dovetail into the burrito. Exactly. <laughs> That's how I like to eat them. All right. All right. Thanks for listening.